Hello and welcome back to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered. I'm John Dicko with the Drone Launch Academy, here to answer your drone questions, or at the very least, find people who can answer your questions. These are questions that you submit. So today's question, it's, it's a pretty specific one. It's, I started my drone business at the beginning of the year and have a connection that is including me and some of her Airbnb shoots. If the client is looking for video aerial content. She's been helping me out with price points and services to offer, but I'm wondering what most property owners look for in terms of content. I know interior shots are a key item, but not sure if my Mini 3 Pro successfully fly indoors. Any ideas on what to include shot-wise and what to keep in mind when working for property owners? I know it's kind of a long one, but I wanted to read this one out word for word. This one actually came out over the Drone Launch Connect community. So today I have with me, I have James Grace. He's the founder of J. MG Imagery. James, thanks for joining me today. Hey, no problem. Great to, great to be on here. So before we dive into this question, can you just tell me a little bit about JMG Imagery? Yeah, so it, it's JMG Aerial Imagery. I've been in business, it was five years in February. I started out, I worked at Sony Pictures for 20 years and got let go in November of 18. So I thought about after I got let go at Sony's, how can I take this knowledge and make my own money, be my own boss, make my own hours, right? I loved Sony. I, I watched movies for a living. You know, times got tough and there's cutbacks, but now it's me making all the decisions, making the timeline. I love it. I, I've always been flying drones even before JMG Aerial started. And I think that was my first step. I had a, you know, a Phantom 3 and just flew for fun. To turn that into a business, it's a dream come true now. Making my own hours, being out in the field all day long. I love it. I have no complaints about it. That is awesome. And you're you're kind of living the dream as many of us in the drone world. Drone Launch Academy world are, are hoping to get kind of that. You know, David and Drone Launch Academy, they do a great job. I was on a Drone to 1K podcast about, I think, three years ago. That was a great stepping stone. And just watching and learning from other guys, gals in the same, what we're all doing taking photos, flying drones, mapping, learning all that from Drone Launch Academy has been great. I still watch it till today. It's the thing that I just go back to just to see what everyone else is doing. Very cool. Thank you. And that's, that's awesome. So talking about GMG Aerial, is there a niche? I do in the industry, but my main focus, 90% of my job right now is construction and commercial real estate. I have three huge construction clients in the Hollywood, Beverly Hills, this morning I was in Malibu doing a five-story home on the beach. That client currently right now, I'm on seven houses with them, all huge multi-million dollar homes where I have NDAs. I wish I could show this footage that I get every day from my construction company because their houses are a hundred million dollar houses. I got so lucky landing this. I'm on retainer now. He pays me a monthly fee. So if we add houses, the retainer goes up, but typically I'm getting paid just monthly now and just give them progress. So I go every two weeks to all the job sites and taking photos, ground photos, aerial photos. A couple of the houses I've been doing drone deploy on, I have a drone deploy account. So I've been doing drone deploy one for just practice for me. And he's been shocked of what I can give back to them. Locked stockpiles showing how much dirt they need to fill something next to the foundation they've dug out. So it's been great for both of us. Awesome. Hey, and congratulations. It sounds like business is going pretty well yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so that's great to hear. And so getting into this question, and you've, you've kind of helped uh, lay the foundation a little bit by talking about the sort of real estate photography you do with the drone. We're answering the question of somebody who's just getting started. And a lot of, I think, what we're trying to answer today is just sort of like, what is the client really looking for? What are some key things to keep in mind? And I don't want to get ahead of anything you were actually kind of starting off right. uh, with the question, but what jumps into your mind when you see this question come in? Yes. The main thing, like what I learned kind of late, I think I've lost a couple of clients because every time now I ask, especially on a commercial real estate job, obviously if it's construction, we're just doing progression. So it's just what's happening on this date. And then two weeks later, and then two weeks later, and then two weeks later, or when someone comes in. But for commercial real estate, I always now, day one is ask for a brochure. Because 99% of the time, they have a brochure already made up with all the stats, with the square footage, what they're trying to highlight. Because you don't want to try to invent the wheel for them unless they need that. But typically, they have their highlights already in their head. So you just want to show them what they're exactly looking for. Obviously, if you think there's a shot that needs to happen, get it and show it to them. But ask for that brochure up front because that brochure has made my workflow so much easier. Instead of going into a job blind, you know exactly what you're, what you're trying to sell to them because that's what they're selling. If it's a commercial real estate building in downtown LA and it's $10 million, they have their highlights. The main thing for me is asking for a brochure every time now. And a lot of times they say, well, I don't have the photos yet. I'm just looking for what you're trying to sell. Yeah. 
And it kind of gives you a pretty immediate idea of just getting on the same page, I guess. Yep. Yeah. You try to put yourself as a videographer, a photographer, you think you look at things in a certain way, but maybe they're not looking at that same exact way. I just did a couple of weeks ago. I did one right next to the Sixth Street Bridge and it's a new development, not development. It's been there for years, but the arts district in downtown LA has been run down over the years. But now the new bridge has gone in, it's becoming the new hot place to be. There's a couple new restaurants in that area. Where that building was at, it's not great. But once you get up and show the location of the Sixth Street Bridge, the walking path, and the location to downtown LA, that's their selling point. And that's once I showed them that and I convinced them, let's do a sunset shot because showing the sunset on downtown LA and highlighting that building. It gets the street a little bit darker because the street wasn't great. And just give him, instead of, he wanted it at high noon, but that was, I think, the worst time to have it. But he did want to show where 6th Street Bridge was, where the 10 freeway is, and where downtown LA was located. And inside that triangle was that building he's trying to sell. And it was amazing. Like, especially at sunset when we have that shot of the sun going down 6th Street Bridge in downtown LA. That's a good example, too, of you kind of being that creative guide to a vision that somebody has in their head. And so you right. yeah. kind of make these changes, recommendations to work as the person. Yeah. Because there was a lot of graffiti. So, you know, it's the graffiti is there. It's in LA. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Just so it doesn't stand out. The twilight shot was the best thing to do for the exteriors. Awesome. Do you take interior shots often on the job? I do. I love the DJI Avada. I fly FPV. Even if they don't ask for it, I ask them, hey, can I have a few minutes? They love the footage every time. So I do. I didn't do it a lot with the Mavic or with the, you know, the Mavic 2. I'm flying the Mavic 3 Cine now. But before I would use a gimbal on a, you know, the Sony A7 III. But now with the FPV, I think I'm strictly FPV flying now um, with the Avada for all my interiors. Wow. You bring up FPV. We've had a lot of conversations about the FPV in this podcast. Is that a better way to take interior? You feel like you have more control over it doing it that way? Or is that just your personal preference? I think the you can get the creative shot. Like that one that was next to the 6th Street Bridge, it was an old building and it had this old freight elevator. And I was able to go in, instead of changing, the stairs wasn't that great, but that old freight elevator was amazing. And to get that shot through the freight elevator was epic. Like to go from the first floor to the second floor to the office area, it was amazing. Are there certain requirements to shoot indoors, whether it's on a commercial real estate site or? I also have this question. I was going to ask my FAA contact because I had a job a couple weeks ago, or it's been a couple months now, probably inside SoFi Stadium. I lost it because I guess SoFi has an exclusive deal with an LA drone company here. Because it's right underneath the runways at LAX, I've gotten clearance at SoFi before for a commercial real estate job across the street. But I think I was wondering, could I fly inside? And I think the answer is yes, because you're in an enclosed building. Do you still need your FAA waiver? And I'm going to, so that's a question for me still that I'm still trying to get answered from my contact with the FAA. Because if you're in an interior building and the drone can't, because what they're afraid of is flyaways, I believe, right? If you can't fly away because you're inside of a, a building, I think you're, you're fine to fly. Don't quote me on that. And I, I was even thinking more too. I mean, just the drone itself. This person has a mini three pro. I've never flown something like that inside. I'm not sure if it would be shaky or if it wouldn't be. Can you repeat the name of what you were flying inside? Is the DJI Avada 2? Avada 2. Or the Avada. I love the Avada. The Avada 2 is just, it's quieter. It doesn't have as much as a hum in it, but I love it. So that flies pretty well inside, huh? It's great. I'm not flying manual. I'm not flying full manual. It doesn't have any obstacle avoidance. So if you hit a wall, you hit a wall. It's so smooth. You're looking through goggles. You're flying that fighter jet. You can put it through 14 inch holes. You know, some of my construction jobs, I love it. I fly it every time now. He doesn't ask for it just for my practice. And I've, I've been loving it. How long have you been flying that drone? I had the Vada 1 probably soon after it came out. Probably so a couple years, probably. I haven't flown full manual yet. On the Vada, you can fly it. So if you let loose the sticks, it just stays right where it's at. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It has return to home function. Like it acts just like a, a Mavic or a Mini 3 or whatever. It's closed loop. Even if you hit a wall, it's not going to go down. It's not going to break a blade. I've bounced off plenty of bushes and trees and interior walls of a house. And you know, it's great to have that closed loop and to have no propellers showing. It's great indoors. Do you stick to one drone? Do you stick to the Avada 2 when you're doing all your, your shooting? Or do you kind of have a arsenal of drones or various I, I cameras? A, I definitely have a drone problem. As you see, I have an Inspire 3 behind me. But yeah, I fly the DJI Mavic 3 for all my exteriors. I fly the Avada for my interiors. Or on the Sony A7, I shoot the Sony A7 IV on a DJI gimbal. I just think the Avada is so much more stable. Even with that walk on the gimbal with the Sony A7, 
I still got that little wobble in it now, just from my walking, you know, but yeah. it's on a gimbal. It's super smooth. I love it to shoot on the Vada and processing through gyro flow. You can make your horizon flat and it doesn't move. It's great. If you, as long as you shoot, not with steady, I forget what the internal flight position is in there, but if you just, if you have it off, you put it through gyro flow and you can choose how much you want the camera to bank or you can lock your horizon. It's amazing. All right. You've talked about a handful of really cool shots you've been able to accomplish with the drum and a unique shot that you couldn't get without the drum. Right. Are you charging more for those particular shots as opposed to maybe more generic? I haven't, you know, unless I'm going to the Inspire 3 at a Netflix job a couple weeks ago, we're doing billboards on Sunset Boulevard. And so I gave them the option of the Mavic or I can put the 50 millimeter lens on the, on the Aspire 3 and just get that depth down because they're trying to, trying to get a billboard and then building further down the road and just made it just that depth reception so much better with it. That's the only time because I, I charge kind of per hour. No matter what I shoot, it's like a flat rate. So my commercial real estate, you know, is starting at four ninety nine, and that's for an edited video with music and everything. So I don't really upcharge for FPV. It's basically I'm charging for my time, and it's what I'm shooting. They're looking for a delivery of a one minute video or two minute video, and and thirty photos or forty photos. It's a just a flat rate, no matter what I shoot with. Unless I'm going to inspire. Okay, no, that's great to know. When I saw that question from you, and what I always do, especially with new clients is asking what their budget is. Because I don't want to say $4.99 and they had $9.99 in their budget. I always ask, what's your budget? And I still have a client where I ask her every single time, hey, what do you have for your budget? Because I'm looking at it, I don't want to lowball myself. They, if they say $2.99, well, the starting rate is $4.99, you know, and then we work with it. You know, I've come down a little bit for some clients because they give me more jobs. Before, when I first started, you know, four or five years ago, I was going outside of LA and Orange County. I was driving 80 miles, 100 miles because I wanted work. I wanted to get the practice in. I never said no. Now I can keep my distance. I don't leave the South Bay area basically now because I have enough clients in this area. If a client, I just went to San Francisco a couple weeks ago because the client one of my LA clients said, Hey, I need a job up there. We worked out a deal and we did it. You know, what is that's what their, what their budget is. Don't, don't worry about yourself. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. You want to keep the business again, speaks to where you're at five years later that you doing it this way. You have created a local client base that you're not traveling across country all the time to face. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. James, I want to give you just any more opportunities here to be any more points to make as regards to this particular question that we're being asked. Yeah, so for that question, I used to do this early on. If you don't have a gimbal and something to shoot with your camera, I've held my drone before because the gimbal's on the drone. The Mini 3 has a gimbal, right? Don't fly it. You can still walk and record with it, but it's still going to be smoother than you trying to hold a camera without a gimbal. Walk with your phone. Or don't necessarily fly through the house, but just do pans. With the drone hovering, do pans. Don't, you know, don't try to go through that hallway. But just be back in that living room, you know, and just do that pan with that drone. So just things like that where you don't need to spend more money and buy a gimbal for your camera, you know, use what you have right now. Get those interior shots and use your camera as your gimbal, the flying gimbal, but you can also carry it. On the Mavic 2, they used to sell a handle that would strap onto the, and it was a handle. So you could just walk with your drone. That I used to use that before I bought my gimbal. That's a, a simple solution. Yeah, that's great. You've been getting advice this entire conversation, obviously. And this is just advice from your own experience, from your five years of experience and what have been a pretty successful five years from what I can tell. We're a community of learners. We all here to learn. I kind of want to ask for your advice, but just kind of for anybody who is kind of starting off, who, who would like to get to the place where you're at. When it comes to having your own business using a drone, somebody who's just diving in and maybe they're not sure what to expect or they're not sure if they can actually do it. Yeah. You know, early on, that first one's free. I would do jobs for local real estate agents. I used to do some residential real estate. I've gone away from them. It's, for me, it's all commercial real estate. But do a job, especially if you're only driving five or 10 minutes, do a job for free to show them what you can give them. That's going to get them in the door. And now you have them hooked. Then you're going to start upselling them. If it's Matterport, if it's a drone shot, or if it's interior shots, saying yes to a client, even if it's for $99. Like, it's weird. I felt like instead of charging low, giving it for free was better than saying, oh, it's only $99 this time, but it's typically $399 or $299 is prove to them that you're worth the money because that's going to, you're going to pay off 10 times over the next couple of years if you do that first job for free. And then when they come back, you feel comfortable uh, charging a little more. Yep. 
especially if you get that one agent that's in an office, you know, here in LA, I'm sure it's bigger than smaller. I don't know where this person was at, but like there might be 10 agents inside that real estate agent office. If you get that one, they're going to talk about you in that office if they like you. So now you're going to do multiple in that same office. That's a great point. That's a great way of looking at it. We get a lot of questions as well about price structures. And so it's kind of cool to get a little bit of advice there. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. I always make sure I don't give them a number. I ask them what their budget is. Great tidbit. Actually, I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you coming on this podcast and sharing your experience. Part of that question was Airbnb, right? She does stuff for that client for Airbnb. And like I said, same thing with the brochure, go look at other Airbnbs before you show up. Cause there might be something that you see that you can say, oh, let's do this. And just cause you've seen it on their main Airbnb page, you know? So just, just look at other ads before you go talk to that client, ask for a brochure, have a game plan before you walk in the door. Well, and I can only imagine how cool it'd be. I mean, yeah, you get the pers- their brochure and you kind of get an idea of what they're looking for when it comes to this particular shoot, but maybe you saw something, yep. got something you've seen there that is awesome and they would be blown away if you yeah. showed them what you can do with the new idea. So. And I think the simple things, like I was looking at photos the other day, is hide trash cans, put up pillows. Like the simplest thing, just walk the house for two minutes before you go and hide that stuff that you don't want to see in a photo. You could fix it. I removed trash cans before, but hide those things. Hide trash cans and fix a pillow. It takes you two minutes. It takes you an hour at post-production or paying someone to remove something. Oh my gosh, yeah. And that would be a headache and more expensive. So. Yeah. So hide those small things, those simple things, especially the real estate agent. Hide the real estate agent. They always like trying to get in the photo. Awesome. Jeeves, I, again, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you. You were busy. Uh, you were even on a shoot this morning and came back in time just to have this conversation with me today. So James Grace, founder of JNG Aerial Imagery. Look him up. They've got really cool stuff. He's active within the Drone Launch Academy community. Speaking of Drone Launch Academy community, if you're not a part of the Drone Launch Connect community, please sign up. You can go onto our website. There's a tab up at the top. Click it, Drone Launch Connect. Sign up. It's very easy. We're a community of just drone lovers, drone learners, drone teachers, and there's advice getting thrown around. There's things being sold. There's It's it's amazing. So check it out. And if you are not part of the Drone Launch Connect community and still would like to submit a question, you can submit your question over ydqa.io. Until then, we'll see you in the sky.